So the shining sun just makes a difference. It makes us happier. So as uh, we start our Sabbath school time this morning, let's, let's pause and bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, um, it is good to be in your house on your Sabbath. Um, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, and I know there's coming a time where this might be a challenge for us, but I just want to thank you for it this morning. I ask that you come and join us, that uh, you will be with us and give us a deeper understanding of the promises and um, what you've written in your word for us. We love you very much, and... Um, Looking forward to spending the entire day with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, Faith and I were tag-teaming. She was going to be up here this morning, and um, we're just switching some things around. So um, it's, uh, well, before I get started here, I usually have my presentation on my iPad here so I can read it. I'm too old to see the screen in the back. Um, but I don't know about you, we have miracles that happened in our house. Things that happened that nobody has any idea how it happened. You have that when you have kids? So right now my iPad screen is shattered and I'm getting glass splinters in my finger and nobody has any idea how that happened. But uh, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Christ in you, the hope of glory, part three. This is a four-part series that we wanted to do. And you can see that we have um, one more to do, which I think the last one is probably the most fascinating. Um, but today is very good as well. It's something that we really need to understand. When we talk about righteousness by faith, what does it really mean? So if we look at it, we have already talked about what our condition is. You know, we are sinful. We need to be, live a perfect life. It's the same requirements that have been from Adam down through time. Um, but we can't do it. I mean, we got a problem. Can't do it. Um, God's solution is to put his righteousness in us. Okay? So we know, we talked about righteousness last time. It's not transforming us, changing us. It is a transplant, getting rid of what we are and putting God in us, okay? So it isn't growing day by day. It isn't, um, well, the best way to put it, we're starting a lesson now on Genesis. It's not evolution. It is creation. He is creating something new in us, okay? He isn't slowly changing us. So this morning, we're going to talk about now, what does it mean, righteousness by faith? What's the purpose of faith? Okay, so we understand that righteousness that God wants to put in us. What does, how does faith come into play? All right. So what exactly is faith? First thing everyone asks, first thing everyone says is Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I read that and read that and reread that. It doesn't really help me a whole lot. Unless there's some context, I'm not really sure, now maybe I'm slower than you, um, exactly what that means. But we go on in the faith chapter and it says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Think about that for a minute. It's impossible to please God if you don't have faith. So we better understand exactly what that means. Okay, I want to please God. All right, so if we go on, let's start, and um, like I said, we're starting in Genesis. We're going to be talking about creation this morning. In Psalms, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Have you ever thought about creation? God simply spoke and it happened. He didn't do something. He just spoke, and it happened. The word itself made it happen. Now, it doesn't work for me. At home, I say, wash the dishes. <laughs> Nothing happens. My word is kind of meaningless. <clears throat> 
But God's word in itself must happen. Think about that for a minute. If God says something, there's nothing that can change it. It has to happen. He is God. All right. In Isaiah, it says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God's word cannot return to him void. It has to happen. Does that make, does that make sense? I mean, when you just think about it. Okay. So, apparently the word of God itself has power. Okay. So when you read a promise in the Bible, where did that come from? Okay. We call the Bible the Word of God. That promise must happen. You can't change it. I don't care what you do. You can't change it. All right. The Word itself will do what He pleases. Um, I think I put too many slides in this morning, so I'm going to keep moving pretty quick. But you'll notice in Philippians and John and Hebrews and what we just read in Isaiah... The word of God, what comes out, will please him. Okay? So you're starting to put together this piece. When we read in Hebrews what faith means, the word that does the things that God is pleased with. Are you starting to see the connection between faith and the word that actually works, the word that is active? Okay, we're going to put those two together because this is what we're talking about. So in short, there's a story in the Bible. We know it, Matthew 8. You can go back and read it. The centurion servant. He comes to Jesus, says, will you heal my servant? Um, Jesus says, you know, let's go. And he says, no, 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 don't go. Just say the word. Okay? This in short is exactly what we're talking about it isn't like the centurion when he says to his soldiers to go do something they go do something when the word comes out of God's mouth it has to happen Jesus said then all right according to your faith let it be done and what happened to the centurion servant immediately he was healed whatever God says has to happen you can't change it. All right. Um, all right. So what is faith now? So let's come back and redefine what faith is since we've, since we've talked about that. Evidently, faith is the recognition that the word of God has power in itself to do exactly what it says, and then expecting that word to do it. You get that part? Expecting that word to do it. So the promise is made. It's sitting there with power, and as soon as we accept it and expect it to do it, it's going to happen. There's no stopping it. Okay? Remember when Jesus said, you know, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. If God made a promise of something, I believe literally could move mountains. If he promised that was going to happen and you accept that by faith, the mountain would move. You can't stop it. This is exactly what uh, Joan says. He says... Um, Faith is the expecting of the word of God to do what it says and then depending upon that word to do what it says. Okay? So we understand what righteousness is. Now, what was righteousness? We're talking about righteousness by faith. Righteousness is what? Right doing. Okay? So God's right doing in us. He told us 
He is going to do that in us. So where does the faith come in? If he has already told us that, all we have to do is believe it, accept it, it will happen. You can't stop it. So when we talk about a church that is going to perfectly reflect the character of Christ and we look at our life and look back in history and say, yeah, I don't know that's going to happen in me, is that faith? No. God said it will happen. So if you truly believe it, it will happen. Okay? Now, you come back to Hebrews. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So that's believing the word or promises of God. And the evidence of things not seen, the inevitable and unstoppable results of his word when we believe it. That is faith. So it's really quite simple. God's word will do exactly what it says. Do you believe that? That's what happened at creation. Exactly what happened at creation. And God is creating in us again. I can't please God without faith. Why can't I please God without faith? Because I can't attain those promises that he's given me. Those promises are meaningless unless I really believe them and accept them. Like they're fact, like they're true, like nothing can change that. There isn't a power in the universe that can change what he has already said. When you believe that, it will happen. So faith is expecting the word of God to do what it says and depending on it. Remember that. So in Review and Herald, Ellen White says, Now Ellen White says the same things as Wagner and Jones, and we know Wagner and Jones as um, really giving the message of righteousness by faith. They just said it in a different way that resonated with people a little differently. But they were all consistently saying the same thing. Here in Review and Herald, she says, the knowledge of what the scripture means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith, so we have, it's necessary for us to cultivate faith, that is more important, that is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. Think about that. More important than any other knowledge that we can acquire. We suffer much trouble and grief because of our unbelief and our ignorance of how to exercise faith. We as a people do not know how to exercise faith, generally speaking. We must break through the clouds of unbelief. We cannot have a healthy Christian experience. We cannot obey the gospel unto salvation until the science of faith is better understood and until more faith is exercised. I like how she calls it the science of faith. Okay? So that faith is not just, um, you know, I believe. Faith is recognizing that God's word must happen and acting as if it will. Okay? So... I called it a new understanding for me. Now, you guys were probably already all there, but in my studies through life, this hit me as an aha moment. Now, like I said, maybe it wasn't for you. In Matthew 4, and Jesus answered and said, it is written, and he's talking to Satan, right? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We are to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God because every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God will happen. Can't stop it. So now, I thought that meant, okay, God says something, now I've got to go do it. God says, Ron, you need to quit lying. All right? So that means I've got to go quit lying. <laughs> Thank you. That's not what it meant. 
Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Ron, you will quit lying because I have said you will quit lying. Once I believe that, it's a done deal. It's done and over. So there's a difference between me reading that and saying, okay, I'm going to go do it. No, it's believing that God is going to do it. And it's already done. All right. So the word itself will do what it says. It's not for me to do it. Okay, you understand the difference. The word is going to do it because it has power in and of itself. It's not for me to get up and go do it. All right. Jesus had right doing by faith. He knew that the power, the very life of God was in the word. That's what we're talking about. So if we take that, go back to the Israelites at Sinai. If the Israelites had faith, they would have received the Ten Commandments not as instructions, but as promises. And that's really what they are. They are ten promises. If God says, you shall not covet, and you believe it, then God's word has power, and that's exactly what's going to happen in your life. So do you, are you seeing the connection between righteousness, living the life that God expects of us, that we have to, living in us, and faith? We have to believe that that power, it's going to happen. All right. So all the Israelites really had to do is say, amen. It's going to be wonderful to see. But what they, they actually said, all that you have said, we will do. It's not for us to do, it's for the word to do in us. All right. All right. So I kind of think we've had this wrong over the years. We've had it a little backwards. Um, I wrote here, have you always thought that the word of God was your instruction and you had to go do it? That's what I kind of thought. You know, that's what we teach. Tell our kids, go be good. No, the word itself has life. Okay, just have to believe it. Now, <clears throat> have you met people who know the Bible inside and out, upside down and backwards? Knowledge is not power. It doesn't matter how much you know about the Bible. Okay? If you see some of these people and you look at them, but there hasn't been any real change in their life. Why? Why no change in their life? No faith. That's what coming back to that statement that Ellen White told us. We don't understand the science of faith. All right. I'm not sure that clock is working there. I just figured it out. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So it truly is the living word. The word it's got from God has life. One of the reasons we as a church have taken so long to realize these things is there's a natural inclination for man to want to do. And honestly, maybe more for men than for women. At home, the wife comes to the husband, explains something. What do we want to do? We don't listen. We want to fix. Right? So we do, okay, okay, I'll take care of that. No, 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 just listen to me. I just want to explain. We want to do. God is saying, no, believe that I have already done. And once you believe and act in that belief, it's done. Christ Object Lessons, page 61. Our part is to receive God's word and to hold it fast, yielding ourselves fully to its control, and its purpose in us will be accomplished. What is its? God's word. So what is our part in all of this? When we want to live a righteous life by faith, what is our part? She says it very plainly here. Is to receive God's word and hold it fast. 
and yield. That's part of the holding fast, I believe. Do we do that? Do we really do that? I'm not sure we do. We read it. It comes in our minds and out another ear. And I don't know that we really believe it because we look back in our life and say, well, from my experience, that can't be true. I, I struggle with this, even intellectually knowing it, accepting that it is already done for me and in me if I believe it. So we know that we live in the last days. Amen? Amen. All right. We know that God is going to have a people that perfectly reflect, reflect his character. Amen? Amen? We know that this 144,000 is going to take the message to the world. And they have to live this message of righteousness by faith before they can give it. You can't share something with someone that you aren't already experiencing. I can't give them book knowledge. I need to also live it. So do you truly believe, sitting here in Centerville Church this morning, that you can live that life? Amen. There are a couple amens. The rest of you are still hesitant? I believe absolutely with all my heart that God can and will change me to perfectly reflect him. That's nothing to do in and of myself. I am not doing that. God is doing all of it. I have to believe it. So in short, so remember this, faith is the recognition that the word of God has power in itself to do exactly what it says, and then expecting that word to do it. I love the story, and I, I come to the story all the time, of Jesus in the boat sleeping. He is sleeping through a storm that is so bad, the disciples ultimately thought they were going to die. Now, for me it's hard to understand. I get motion sickness, so I'm not sure how he was sleeping. But So he's there, he's sleeping. He is not worried about it. He wakes up, tells them, oh, ye of little faith. In other words, I have called you for a purpose. It's not to die on a lake in a storm. If the disciples had believed what, God, what Jesus had already told them, would they have thought they were going to die? No. Could any one of those disciples in the boat stood up and said the exact same thing Jesus said. Absolutely. Bring that to our life. Do you recognize that we can do the same thing? I mean, with those promises that God has already told us will happen, his word cannot return to him void. It will do exactly what it says. We are to live by faith in every word that comes out of the mouth of God. We are not to do the word. The word is to do us. I know that sounds a little funny, but I kind of like it. The word is to do us. Okay? It's not your job to get up and do it. It's your job to believe it is already going to happen. The word of God has life in itself. So these are the takeaway points. This is something that is interesting about God. I can't explain it, but God is God. His word has life in itself, and it's going to happen. It will do what it says. It cannot, I cannot do what the word says. I am to live the word. I am to let the word do what it says in me. The word is to live itself in me. Now, we know also that we call the Bible the Word of God. But who, who is the Word? Jesus. Jesus. He's also the way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus is the Word. Let me put this together. 
if Jesus is living in you, the word is living in you, what do you have to worry about? Nothing. It is going to happen. So when we talk about the assurance of salvation, I've always been a little hesitant to say, you know, are you assured of your salvation? Um, and a little hesitant, well, yes, as long as I stay faithful. Well, probably. We can be sure of our salvation because God has said what he will already do. And his word cannot return to him void. Does that make sense this morning? Amen. All right. Next time, the last one that kind of wraps this all up and puts this together, I'm really excited about. And um, we are going to talk about putting this together. What does it mean, Christ in you, the hope of glory? And it pulls it all together. But remember, this message of righteousness by faith is the last day message. It is what's going to prepare God's people to stand before him and see him. It is going to be what prepares the world to see Jesus return. It is also going to be what many people rise up against and say, no, it can't be. But this is so pivotal, pivotal and so important that we need to understand it. All right. I hope I said it in a way that made sense. Like I said, Wagner and Jones have been saying the same thing. Ellen White have been saying the same thing. But sometimes when we say it a little differently, it just comes across different. And people, all of a sudden, for me, it's like, aha, it makes sense. God's word has to happen. So as we break for Sabbath school this morning, um, we know that there are several classes, one behind the glass, the library, um, pastor's office, um, etc., and so also one here in the sanctuary. I would encourage you to join any one of those that you would like if you're a visitor. We are glad you're here. And let's uh, close with prayer here as we go into our lesson study. Father in heaven, uh, it is so amazing and even hard to believe sometimes that your word, anything that you desire will happen if we believe it and you have so many promises that you have given us in the Bible and when our life fits that situation and we accept that by faith and we look at it and say okay that is in our life help us to truly have faith and believe that your word is alive and is going to happen and that we don't have to worry about what is coming next because we already know I want to thank you for your promises. I want to thank you for your omnipotence and for your love for us and wanting us to, to have that perfect life in you. Um, I just want to thank you for that this morning. And I ask that you help really settle this into our hearts and minds that we understand this and are drawn closer to you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, good morning. Welcome back. Probably a little too much Ron time this morning, but it just happens to be the luck of the draw, I suppose. All right. Well, how was everybody's week? We are blessed, aren't we? We need to recognize that more. Um, let's have prayer again. I, always, I don't think we can ever have enough prayer. Father, as we open our lesson, we're starting a new quarter um, in Genesis. Um, it's an amazing book, and I ask that, um, that you will be with us, that you will join us, that you will open our hearts and minds, because we want to understand more and more and more about you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I won't spend a whole lot of time this morning, but there are a few things noteworthy in the news. Um, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but uh, uh, President Zelensky in Ukraine has appealed to the Pope to bring peace to the Ukraine-Russian conflict. I think that is very significant. It might, some of you might have glossed over that, but I think that is very significant. Um, recognizing uh, the Vatican as the world leader um, and asking them for peace. Where does real peace come from? God. And remember, when they say peace and safety, then... Sudden destruction. I believe, I'm not saying specifically in the Ukraine-Russian war, but I believe the papacy will be instrumental in bringing this peace. You know, when we say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. And then because of that, as God removes his spirit more and more, that destruction is going to happen on the earth. But I believe the papacy will be involved in the peace that appears to be in the earth. So I just thought it was interesting that uh, President Zelensky appealed to the Pope for that. Um, tornadoes this past week, a lot of damage and some death. Um, there was also some news that uh, earthquakes are at their highest point. It's like the whole world just kind of shuddering, just kind of shaking and about what's coming. So a lot of volcanic activity. Um, you know, I'm not even really sure how to frame up the Russian-Ukraine war. Um, but it is very, very sad to see. And the devil is pleased in all that. There's no doubt about it. Um, flooding, um, fatalities in Iowa on more tornadoes. Um, Europe is coming together, which I think is significant. Um, I think this is helping co coalesce Europe. Um, when we talk about the king of the north, I believe that will play a role when we look at uh, Daniel 11. Um, <laughs> this one was just crazy. I don't even know why I'm going to mention it. Cal this, is a, this is a proposal. California is talking about abolishing parenthood in the name of equity. <laughs> I could read it to you. It's just crazy. But uh, some kids have advantage over other kids. And so if we abolish parenthood and raise our kids as a community... Um, then it's more fair and equitable. Oh, all we have to really do is read the Bible. Isn't, isn't that the truth? All right. So our lesson this morning, Genesis. I'm excited about it. I like Genesis. I think it's a great book. So uh, I'm not sure we're going to get past Genesis 1.1. It's not that many words, but it's very, very um, important. 
So as we start this morning, I have one question, and honestly, I've thought about it and thought about it, and I actually, I'm not quite sure how to answer it. So I'm actually looking for help this morning. When you look at the Bible, are we supposed to interpret it literally or metaphorically? Now, the answer, I think, is simple, but why? Is the Bible interpreted literally or metaphorically? And give me a reason why. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Now, Jesus taught in parables, did he not? Which is kind of a metaphor. First of all, what is a metaphor? Does everyone know what a metaphor is? It's raining cats and dogs. That's a metaphor. Um, it's an example or uh, uh, an illustration of something. I mean, it's raining really hard, okay? So when we read Genesis and throughout the Bible, is it metaphorical or is it literal? So let's answer that first. All right, explain, Joe. Uh, you can't just take and say, all right, the entire Bible is literal because then I miss the prophetic message and I miss the metaphors that Christ used in order to avoid his critics. If I say everything is metaphorical, then I miss the literal interpretation and how it gets applied to my personal life. So, how do you tell the difference? Yeah, that's where a lot of Bible scholars have screwed up. That's exactly right. I don't know if you could hear Joe. Um, very profound words. That's where a lot of Bible scholars get screwed up. So, how do you know? So, the flood. Metaphorical or literal? Why? We just said the Bible could be sometimes metaphorical, sometimes literal. So what makes you say the flood is literal when others say it's metaphorical? That one could be both also. It's what? That one could be both also. Could be both also? Literally, yeah. look at it in the future of God's people being saved, it's metaphorical. Okay. So how do I tell? So we're coming to Genesis at the very beginning. I'm standing at a point, and right away, before I go anywhere, there's two paths. How do I interpret as I go through Genesis? Scott. You need to let the Bible interpret itself. Okay. Study it the way it wants to be studied, comparing Scripture to Scripture. Then it sort of tells you whether or not it's literal or figurative. So when it comes to the case of creation, there is nothing in the Bible that even suggests that it's metaphorical. Jesus confirms it in the New Testament as a real event. You can look at the names and the genealogies from Genesis all the way through wherever the Bible takes the genealogies. Those people really existed. They weren't make-believe people. Okay. So those people in the genealogy of Genesis really existed. They have uh, lifespans. They have years. Um, that was all literal. But evolutionary creation is becoming the dominant belief in Christianity. It is the Bible and the Genesis account is being taken as a metaphor to represent something that happened over a longer period of time that God kind of manipulated. So, hand here first. So, I think most of the time, when the Bible is speaking literally, it tells you it is literal. The Bible itself tells you that. <coughs> and when it is metaphoric, it will tell you that. Jesus, when he is going to tell a parable, he said, let me tell you that stuff. And after that, he explained it. And you see that even in the prophecy, they give you symbols, and maybe the chapter after us, the Bible is going to explain you mm -hmm. what was each image was giving you what that's mean. So if you read the Bible, for example, if you read chapter one, but you go in chapter two, verse four, this say this is the story of. So it's telling you it is a story. It is the history. 
And when we are talking about history, we are actually talking about fact. Okay. It happened. History, it's facts, it happened. And the Bible also says that this is the history of how the earth was created. So that means it cannot be taken as a metaphor when the Bible is telling it is history. Okay. Yes. John here can touch on what I was saying as well. You know, first of all, you have to have that have to have faith to even accept the Bible as you read. So to prove other things that they're literal or metaphorical, sometimes you can take other historical accounts or someone else was commented, you know, men and witnesses. So, but at the end of the day, it has to be by faith that you have to accept the Bible, first of all. Okay. So by faith, you have to accept the Bible, first of all. Now, giving Bible studies, we, I have numerous times, you know, you start out, how do you believe the Bible? Prophecy is a wonderful way to prove that the Bible is accurate. It happens exactly how God said. Okay? There was another hand. John. this particular verse that we're discussing today, evolution has no answer for how things happen. They just say, well, it's a big bang. Well, that may sound to me like a lot like creation, but it says right here, the first words, in the beginning, God started it. And there's no explanation from, from uh, evolution as to how anything got started. They take okay. things at a certain point and then develop it over what they consider millions of years, but they don't start it. And even that, the, the millions of years things doesn't necessarily make sense either. But uh, that only, that, that's, that's only been developed as a way to explain the world without God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, that's and the whole issue. science, so-called, right. is supporting something different. You know, so this is where we get this, it's called theistic evolution. The, Confusion becomes organized as yes. it evolves. And I personally do not see that we've improved on the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Maybe I'm just looking in the wrong places, but it does not appear to be getting better. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so chaos into order instead of everything that we seem to see is the other way around. Order moves to chaos. Scott. God himself is a metaphor for something else. God, right. as we understand him as a person, doesn't really exist. It's just a metaphor for physics or something, science, as you said. So, so then it's just a farce that we're here today. It's just a book of fables. There you go. So I had to, one second, I had to look up and, not quoting this as a source of authority, but Wikipedia, and... Uh, <clears throat> it says, I'm just going to read it. It says, uh, you know, Moses uh, was supposed to have written the first five books, um, but modern scholars, especially from the 19th century onward, see them as being written hundreds of years after Moses um, is supposed to have lived in the 6th and, sixth and 5th centuries B.C. <clears throat> Based on scientific interpretation of archaeological, genetic, and linguistic evidence, most scholars consider Genesis to be primarily Judeo-Christian mythology rather than history. So that's in Wikipedia that a lot of people read. Go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So it's kind of what we were talking about in advance here in the superintendent comments. God's word has power. All right. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So let's break this down. In the beginning. When was that? No one knows. You laugh at the question. 
But I'm being kind of serious. When was it? In the beginning. Well, first of all, that's a good question because God has no beginning. Okay. So in the beginning of what? There you go. It is saying there is a beginning of something. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So what are we talking about? In the beginning. Creation. So there was a time, a point, something, that none of anything that we understand or recognize or realize existed. Okay? Do we, are we okay with that? All right. So God created everything that exists. Did he create the laws of nature? Okay, so the laws of nature didn't exist at some point before. Okay? So, you know, we call outer space. There's also inner space. Everything is kind of built the same way if you look at God's building blocks. If you look in an atom, you have electrons rotating around neutrons and protons. And uh, if you collapse it all down, you could collapse everything that's in the world down to, you know, put it in a thimble. It's mostly space, inner space. There's outer space. We understand the universe to be continuing to expand. What's on the other side of outer space? Uh, space? Nothing. It's, that edge is increasing. So God created in the beginning. Did God create time? If he created everything that existed, did God create time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um... <laughs> When the sun was lit? He created time for humans. Yeah. Okay. Now, we're probably going to, we don't want to venture into things that we're not told and gets into speculation. But uh, I believe if God created everything, he did create time. So what existed before time? God. Now, have you ever sat and thought about it? How does God know the beginning from the end? How can he, in prophecy, so accurately tell us what is happening thousands of years in advance? I've had some people tell me that, well, God is like a supercomputer. He takes all the probabilities of every event that is, could possibly happen and computes it, and this is the way it's going to turn out. He can, he can compute that. I don't buy that one. So how does God know exactly what's going to happen. He knew, we're told he knows us before we were born. How does God know that? He either sits above time and can see it, or he exists in all time. All right. Sits above time or exists in all time. That. It makes the story of redemption far more important because God knew when he gave us the power of choice, this whole thing could blow up and we've done our best to do exactly that, but he still created Lucifer. Yep. Mm. He knew how that was going to turn out, didn't he? In yeah, essence. Exactly. He, he, he knows it all. He knows when I'm going to screw up. So when we, I know someone said earlier, we as humans argue about some things that shouldn't be argued about because we don't understand. Okay. <laughs> God always existed. Well, if God always existed, there was a point that there wasn't time. So here's the timeline. At the beginning of this timeline, there's this kind of this cloud, this bubble. And we say, well, who came first and what? We don't understand these things. We don't understand without time. Mm -hmm. for our redemption. And so he knows the beginning from the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Yes. And the other thing is to do with time, when the sun was flung into the sky and then the moon, and he said, you know, uh, from sunset to sunrise would be one day. That was implementing time in my mind. So... 
Okay? We're going to touch on that a little bit. Comment? What's the problem when you put, you try to put human understanding outside of the knowledge of the Bible? You come up with some very strange theories. But you know, this is the point I'm trying to make is we may not necessarily be able to explain everything. But the Bible has told us what we need to know. Amen? Um, and there may be some things that we can just say, I don't know, but that's not necessary at me for me right now. But I've got all eternity that God is going to teach me. Yes. So when we start speculating about some of those things, it's probably not that important. If God didn't tell us, it's not that important. Something has always existed. So if, if you're a creationist, it's God. Okay. If you're not a creationist, you've got a problem. Because matter has always existed, or energy has always existed, or something has always existed. If you believe in a big bang, it was just all boiled down into something, but that something already existed. So something has to have all, always existed. Whether it's God or it's matter or whatever it is, something has always existed. It has to be. So either way, it's faith. I'd rather have faith in God than faith in matter, if that makes sense. Okay. Something always existed, Scott, Scott said. So let's come to the next words. In the beginning, God created. All right. Did God create from something? Doesn't need to. That's the point. But it came forth from itself. Yes. Right? So, so God existed or matter existed, as you were saying, exists. came from himself. Deb, I'm kidding. This is great. We're all alive this morning. I know. So if God has always existed, the law is a transcript of his character, so yeah. in essence it has always, always been. All right. But the point on created I want to make is the difference between God as creator and we when we create something. We rearrange energy and matter. God creates out of nothing. Yes. That's the difference. God is beyond our comprehension. How do you make something out of nothing? Again, I can't explain it. God's God. Now, we understand the basic laws of physics that uh, conservation of energy. I can change energy from the sun that causes a tree to grow. Um, it produces this big tree. Um, the tree dies. We can burn it as wood. We, you know, have heat. It's... It's a transfer, but we cannot create. God creates. Take that into our lives. Does God transfer, manipulate, mold, and fix us, or does God create us new? When we say we are born a new person, is God slowly, evolutionarily, making us into something that's acceptable? Yes. He puts the event, or however you want to term that, in front of us. And he gave us the free will to choose which way to go. There's always free will. Scott. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
Behold, all things have become new. All right. Created. The, the understanding of creation is so important to the understanding of salvation. That, Joe. Your thought, but... No, go ahead. On Scott's theory that we're a new creation, all things, it is justification. The perspective of what really is new as I mature in Christ changes. So what I thought was a new creation that God did in me 20 years ago, I reflect today and see that God is still doing a new creation in my heart. Amen. But it's because my perspective has changed on who God is and my love and desire to serve Him. Okay. So Joe is saying God is continually creating in us. Is that accurate? Wrong. Either we accept him as our creator and recreator, or we don't. And that's why the world is in the mess that it is. So when we come to the first angel's message in Revelation 14, what is the first angel's message? Worship your creator. Okay. Why do we worship God? Because we love him. We love him. We love him because he first loved us. He loves us because... He has asked us to worship him for okay. us because he created us. He created us. So, in obedience, we will worship him because he is the sustainer and creator of life. It all comes down, in my mind, it all comes down to God as creator. It boils down to this. Now, Satan has tried to supplant that. So when we come to, in the beginning, God created. This is what also started the great controversy. The controversy is between Christ and Satan. Satan wanted to be part of the creation. But Lucifer is a created being. Okay? So, this even without saying it, in the first, is talking about the origins of the great controversy as well. So, in the beginning, God created. So, God. Who is God? Creator. We've said that. Perfect. Isn't this, I mean, to me this is fundamentally important because the third angel's message is we are to worship God, the creator. Now, there are, Satan has down through time um, tried to divert our attention into other gods. Primarily, if you will, sun god has really been prominent through everything. Even in, if you truly understand it, I mean, it's, sun worship is part of the papacy, etc. But you can understand how man started to worship the creation instead of the creator because of what we see. The sun brings life. We understand the conservation of energy. Pretty much all of our energy comes from the sun, and it is responsible basically for everything. So, Satan has tried to divert us into worshiping, really, him. Sun worship is, and other worship, is the worship of Satan. So, it is important for us to understand the difference that God is creator, and that's why we worship him, versus Satan wants to be worshiped, was never part of the creation process, and is trying to supplant God. He says he wants to sit on the sides of the north. What is that? God's throne. God's throne. Why? You're, you're on it. If you look at the sanctuary, the door in the sanctuary is on the what side? 
east side. So as you come into the sanctuary, you're facing west, very deliberately, because the pagans all face east to worship the rising sun. All right, so their back is to the sun, they're facing west as they come in. You come in, um, past the altar and so on, the holy place, you have the candlesticks on the left, or the, which direction? Where is the table of showbread? The right. To the right. <coughs> north. north. And we say Satan wants, you know, sit in the sides of the north. He wants to sit on the north side. The table of showbread, two stacks of bread, representing the Father and the Son, sitting on the throne. The Son sits at the right hand of God. The table is overlaid with gold. It has two crowns around the edge of the table. This is the throne of God. Satan wants to sit there, but he's not creator. Okay, so that's how we get, you know, Satan, he wants to sit on the sides, he wants to sit on the north side of the sanctuary on the throne like God. Thought I heard something. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What are the heavens and the earth? Talking about they are they are different heavens. Okay. So Paul speaks cannot, of three. Yeah, so three. So we're talking about what we see, the atmosphere, the firmament of, then okay. you go up to outer space. So when it says created the heavens and the earth, it's still in the context of the universe, not that he created heaven where he lives. Okay. So you're saying he didn't create heaven where he lives, but he created maybe what was re in relation to the earth. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Any other thoughts on that? Or universe, because they're, uh, they're on fallen worlds. Okay. So. When did God create the other unfallen worlds? We know they exist. <laughs> I don't know. That's one of those things that doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> I'm just saying, if you look at the creation account, it said he created the stars also. Stars would be more than just our sun because it's a plural. All right. So he created the stars also. Um, that would include the galaxies, uh, more than just our world. Well, but the teacher in the scriptures also say that everything that was made was created by God. Okay. So let's, let, anything that is in this universe or that God did not create. You're right. And I skipped that in my notes. And thank you for bringing me back to that. So, everything that was created was created by God. Who, I know this is going to sound crazy, but bear with me. Who created? Jesus, Christ, God. Is there a difference? Yes. The Bible tells us very clearly. Go ahead, Joe. This is where a very dangerous theology has started to creep in in various circles of Christianity to where they've removed the divinity of Christ and made him a created yes. being. Yes. And that's where the danger arises as well because Lucifer, once again, pulling away the worship of a God, i.e. Jesus, to now he's a created being, which would be now a creature. And Romans 1 talks very plainly about the devastation that brings on mankind when we stop worshiping the God and the truth and take the creature and the lie instead. The Bible is very clear, we're not going to go through it this morning, um, that uh, Jesus is divine. Jesus was not created. Okay, He deserves our worship because, let me, let me explain this, why does Jesus deserve our worship? We are told that God created through Jesus. And all the joy and everything comes back to God through His Son. He's the channel. He was the channel for creation. He's the channel for love and joy that comes back. Everything goes through His Son. Go ahead. And we just got over that lesson. 
That's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2. Okay. It says that. that. That's exactly right. So when we are told to worship the Creator, it is both Father and Son. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so thank you. I kind of skipped over that in my notes. And they created everything. Okay. Yep. says that he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Yep. Of Christ. So Christ, it is true Christ that all these things consist, or they are held together. So there are other texts like that too that substantiate the fact that Jesus Christ. Ephesians, is true Hebrews, Christ. yes. All right. Go ahead. We have what? Patriarch and oh, Patriarchs and Prophets. Okay. This is a good book because it's very, it even starts before the creation, the stay of our earth. Because we are talking about creation here of the earth and the heavens, but we did not put credit in the context because we, as a part of the creation, as human beings, we have been created the last. Okay. We have been created after the angels. And if you read Patriarch and Prophet, you won't even understand that we have been created after the controversy between Satan and Christ have started. We have been created after that, all that have already happened. And at that moment when Jesus created a thing, he was creating also to show the angels that he was truly God. Because the, there was an issue in heaven, Jesus Christ was living in the angels like an angel. And Lucifer was not understanding why sometimes Jesus goes and has a private meeting with God, but he's an angel. He was not understanding that. And if you read Patriarch and Prophet, you understand how God the Father and came to talk to Lucifer. This Jesus you see is God. He is not a, an angel. And Lucifer comes to understand that, but he has some pride to recognize what he has been, yep. have been a first thought. But in that process, it is that moment that God and the God had said, let's show to the angels that also we created, and they created us. Jesus created a new world. Demonstrating there to the angels, they did it in that, that he what well, is the creator. But before that, the angels, as, as today, have to believe when God took them, I created you, they did not have seen that. Before that, they just you have to believe God. After Jesus created us, they knew that he was the creator. Yes. I think that sometimes the contest we forget to. For some reason, I mean, it's boy, we didn't get anywhere where we needed to go today. My fault. <laughs> um, you know, talking about talking about the creation, we we know that God the Father called all of heaven together and said, you know, you are to also worship my Son as if I, you know He were me in my place. Um, so there appeared to be some type of confusion that maybe Lucifer had had instilled that there is no distinction. Um, if you can invite Jesus in to be part of the creation, you can, why can't I be part of it? But we've talked about that. Um, almost the last act of creation is man. What is the last act of creation? Sabbath. Sabbath. Well, teacher, I don't know if you have it in mind, but um, I saw something that is used Often, as an argument, this, this idea of about a billion years or billions of years between the different things that God created, what I would want to say is that a weekly cycle puts a span or a spoke in the wheel of that argument. Because could you imagine that God created Adam and it's, the Bible says that he took a rib out of Adam. He took another million years to take that rib and make it. It, does, it just does not make sense. 
undone. That is why the weekly cycle God established it as time. And with that, it, it presents a difficulty for the thousands and the millions of years. Because um, the Bible says on the evening and the morning. That is clear. That mm -hmm. cannot be a billion years. So I saw that coming out in the lesson where the evolutionists the evening and the morning, or the first day, day, the, the evening and the morning, day, or the second day, although the sun was not created yet. Um, so this is where we get the arguments and theistic evolution comes in, which if you buy into that, what does that do to the Sabbath? It's kind of meaningless as the seventh day. Um, so many things we, we could hit on this morning. Genesis is just a, such a wonderful book. But God is an all-powerful God, which... Two things I wanted to point out, see if we can squeeze it in before it closes. I love that the author finally brought this out um, on Sunday's lesson, uh, middle of the second paragraph. says, the name Elohim denotes preeminence and strength, and the use of the plural form of the word Elohim expresses the idea of majesty and transcendence. The reason I bring that out is most Bible scholars today recognize this. And we just need to be careful that we don't look ignorant when we say Elohim is the plural form of the word and thus God is, you know, a multi-faceted God. Um, Elohim here, when in the beginning God, Elohim, Elohim is used to describe majesty, greatness. It's the plural of majesty. Jericho was called Elohim. Moses was called Elohim. Elohim is used multiple times throughout the Bible. It's not describing a Trinity Godhead. So that's where some people get confused, but just understand that. And I appreciate the author bringing that out. But why God creates, his word creates. Why did God create Eve from Adam? We are created in God's image, by the way, which we could spend a lot of time on. And just, I thought is fascinating. If you take a bone out of the body, generally, it's gone, okay? I can perform surgery on you, I can take your femur out, it's not coming back. Where is that bone? That's another thing. <laughs> if I take a rib, here I'm just reading it, ribs regenerate to a near normal and radiological profile within six months of a costectomy which gel foam scaffold is placed in the rib bed. Basically, in their study, um, blah, 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 um, ribs can regrow. Did you know that? No. I thought that was fascinating. Now, whether that was part of the creation process, and God said, I'm going to take a rib out of Adam, use it for Eve, and then henceforth, ribs are going to regrow, or whether, I, it doesn't really matter. But I just thought that was fascinating that a rib can regrow. So Adam was not living his life without a rib. It grew back, but yet Eve was part of Adam. Go ahead. It's amazing in this creation process that everything else God spoke and it was done, it was created. But in yes. creating us, man and woman, he literally yes. used something else that was created to create us. Yes. And then it was very personal. Yes. The lesson brings all that out. We don't have to go over it. Um, but it was very personal, up face to face. And Eve came from Adam. Um, I, would, I would suggest spending some time talk, or looking at how we were created in God's image. Because this is also so important. We are very unique as a creation. We were created in God's image. And honestly, I think that's why. Have you ever wondered why Eve wasn't part of the creation process? Why didn't he make Eve right next to Adam? It is so odd that he took something from Adam and then made Eve. Why? There's reasons for it. We are created in the image of God. And Double bell is rung, and I'm going to go ahead and close with prayer and let you guys sort that out. <laughs> Let's have prayer.
Father, we didn't get very far this morning, but um, I believe your word as it's written. And with faith, I accept what you have written here. We don't have all the answers. We can't explain everything because you are God. You are the creator. You are so far above us. We are your creation. But yet we take what you have given us and we believe it. We want to worship you. We want to follow you because we know that you have a plan to, that you want to live with us for eternity, that you want to teach us, grow us, for millions and billions of years, living a life with you, and I look forward to that day. Um, I want to thank you for the lessons this quarter and really guide us closer to you. Um, help us to understand who you are. As Jesus came to reveal who you are um, as God, and I want to thank you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.